Many years ago, I was sitting at a theater with some friends, and we were watching an adventure movie, and the projector jammed. I don't know if you've ever had that happen, and the film actually broke. Now, this is not, you know, a whole long time ago. I mean, this wasn't silent movies or anything. Don't get that kind of idea. But, but it was a dollar cinema, and it was in the days when they only had one movie in one theater. You know, I, some of you may remember that, others of you don't. But... To make matters worse, what happened is that the breakdown wasn't at the beginning of the movie before we got emotionally involved. It was right at the end. It was at that magic moment in a movie, you know, where you're at the edge of your seat and it was right there and very, very exciting. And just before the film broke, see, we were, as an audience, in another world, a wonderful world, a, a few glorious moments there. We had forgotten about the here and now. And we were just lost in the there and then. We were surrounded by the soundtrack, you know, that one speaker back then, it wasn't the Dolby kind of stuff. But we were caught up in that story and we were dazzled by the special effects as they were back then. But then all of a sudden it came to a crashing halt, a screeching halt. Without warning, the music stopped, the screen went white, and a collective gasp went up from the audience there as we shielded our eyes from the sudden light. And those gasps quickly turned to groans. See, some unruly types, not me, but some others, threw some popcorn and milk duds and all those kind of things and started to cause kind of a ruckus and all that. And in a few seconds, uh, the lights went on, the house lights went on, and the reality returned. And soon, an employee came in to say, I'm sorry, guys, the projector cannot be fixed right now. Here's your dollar back. Now, we didn't want our dollar back. We didn't want the money, we wanted the movie. So that was really kind of a small concession to us. But the real thing, the real point for us is that, you know, one moment we were in a galaxy far, far away. And in the next minute, we were back in a run-down dollar cinema with worn-out seats and peeling paint and sticky floors. And you know what? We went from that glorious there and then to the not-so-glorious here and now. And it wasn't an easy transition for us. We didn't like it. And in a way, that's kind of what happens in my heart, if I can be that frank, as I read from 1 Corinthians 15 into 1 Corinthians 16. And you might say, well, how so? Well, this is the thing. 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection. Now, Pedro and I, we, we alternate and we have fun doing that. And sometimes, you know, it falls in a place that you go, wow, I wanted that one, or you wanted that one. And you know, he got the resurrection last week. Now, I've had my share of really great chapters. I've had my share of more challenging ones, you know, but I kind of went, mm. you know, 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection, one of the most glorious chapters in the Bible. So we're just going to talk about that one again. No, we're not. <laughs> uh, it, but here's the thing. It kind of transports you to another time and place, right? The there and then, as I call it, eternity, you know, this thing that's out there that we know is out there and we look forward to it and it fills us with that hope of heaven and we start to say, yeah, I can hardly wait for there and then and, you know, death defeated and the presence of God, you know, face to face with him, a glorified body. I like the thought of that more and more all the time. No pain, no sorrow, no suffering. The resurrection, majesty, glory, hallelujah. And then... <laughs> Verse 1 of chapter 16, Paul kind of brings us back to the here and now. Rather abruptly, I might say, with these words, it says in verse 1, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so must you do also. Now, right away, if, if there's a, a mood breaker, certainly it's to say the collection, huh, the collection for the saints, money, must do, he says in there. And I can kind of picture a collective groan going up from Corinth there as they see that. Weren't we just talking about heaven, you know, the streets paved with gold, and now you want to have me share a little bit of the gold that I got right here? And I can picture them again kind of complaining, we don't want to focus on the here and now. We want to talk about the there and then. That's a lot more fun. And admittedly, 1 Corinthians 16 is a challenging chapter. It's a here and now kind of chapter. And it can be painfully practical in some places. And it can be a tough transition for some of us, maybe. To go from here to heaven, oh, now that's my kind of transition. But to go from heaven to here, mm, I don't like that one quite as much. And that's exactly what happens here. And there's a part of me, maybe a part of you, that kind of wishes that the Corinthian letter finished 
in the 15th chapter. You know, what a way to end it. On the resurrection of the glorified body, amen, let's go and enjoy that time now. But unlike that broken projector and that failed film there, see, the end of 1 Corinthians is no mistake. In fact, God doesn't make mistakes. There are no mistakes in his word. It's not a malfunction. It's not a breakdown in your Bible. God's word is perfect, and we believe that, I hope, in our head, but also know it in our hearts as we go along. And we'll see here that God gives the perfect ending to this book, I believe, 1 Corinthians. And tonight's chapter is really actually a perfect follow-up to a chapter on eternity. And you might ask yourselves, why? Well, this is really the main memory thought for tonight. If, if you walk away with one thing, I'm hoping this is it. It's that God wants you to live here and now in the light of there and then. He wants us all to live in the here and now in the light of the there and then. And God wants us to make that direct connect between earth and eternity. For him, there's really no real split. We tend to think of now as so real and then as so, well, I don't know, hopeful and all, all that, but it's very intangible to us sometimes. But to God, not so. And so he wants us really to connect the two so very directly. And it's with that thought in mind that you'll see that the transition between these two chapters, it's not really as abrupt and unusual and unexpected as it may have seemed at first. Look with me at the last verse of chapter 15, verse 58. If you have it there open on your lap, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain, in the Lord. So anytime you see the word therefore, you need to ask yourselves, what is that therefore? Well, it's pointing to what came before, and that is the discussion of the resurrection. There's all of that detail there. And at the very end of it, he says, because of that, in light of that, with that in mind, therefore, you know what? There's worthwhile work here on earth. There's labor that's going to last beyond the grave. See, and what we do here and now has everything to do with there. And then, and there's a very common complaint that I've heard, maybe you've even had it in your life or seen it said, which is that a certain person is so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. You know, all they want to talk about and think about is eternity and they never make a difference in this world here and now. But that's the thing. See, that could never really be the case with a true biblical believer. Why? Because the more we focus on heaven the more useful we will be, the more fruitful we will be here on earth. The more we believe in the resurrection reality, well, the more motivated we will be to serve the Lord in the little bit of time we have here and now. And the things that we do here and now have everything to do with there and then. It's an investment in it. And that injects such a significance, such a meaning, such a passion into our lives as believers. And so again, the major point of this chapter and what I hope we'll all walk away from this teaching knowing is that God wants us to live the here and now in the light of the there and then. And just if you want to tack on a kind of sub-thought to that, if you can remember two things, what we are believing is how we will be living. What we are believing is how we will be living. There's a connection between those two, what we're believing about the there and then, about eternity, is how we will be living here on earth. And so three major areas are discussed here in this last chapter that will be affected directly by our belief system, by our faith, by our trust in Christ. And the first one is possessions. And we see Paul talking about that. He was never shy about the subject, and so I guess we should not be either. But you see in verse 2, it says, On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay up something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there may be no collections when I come. Now, he's talking there about a collection, an offering, and it's important to see that it's not to line Paul's pocket. It's not to make Paul prosperous. No, it was actually from the Gentile churches to the Jerusalem church. And Paul himself, though he was a Jew, he was really the apostle to the Gentiles. He wasn't even really that tied in with the Jerusalem church. But to really grasp the point of this passage, to help us understand it and really get our minds and hearts around it, we need to know that there was a lot of hatred historically, a lot of animosity even in the present, 
that just naturally, historically existed between the Jews and the Gentiles. Gentile, just a Bible world, world for non-Jew. And so Jews and everybody else, that's the Gentiles. So you're either one or the other. And so it was very true that there had been a rift, there had been a wall between those two groups, and in some ways still today, but certainly not for those who have put their faith in Christ. And so the idea that Paul had, and it was a God-given idea, was that they would voluntarily share, the Gentiles would, of their possessions with the Jews, and in that radical demonstration of a different way of doing things than the world would ever do things, it was a sure sign of God's work in their lives. And so Corinth was a, a Gentile area, primar primarily non-Jewish, and it was very prosperous. You may remember from the earlier parts of this chapter, and this book here, as we gave the introduction, you see that it was a port city, and a port city kind of like Miami has been, well, it can be a very prosperous place because all of the merchandise would come and go. Some of it legal, some of it not so legal. But the bottom line is Corinth was a very rich place. And so pagans uh, would be pretty tolerant in that kind of society. Pretty much anything goes as long as you don't bother me with your beliefs. And so the Corinthians really weren't a persecuted church per se. They were ones who, you know, they had their God and the pagans had their God and nobody really cared, just leave me alone and that sort of thing. But what that meant practically is that you could be a, a Christian in Corinth without a lot of persecution. You could still have a lot of prosperity. You could still be doing pretty well financially in that place here and now. And so you could be living high on the hog in Corinth. And in contrast, the Jews, of course, would never live high on the hog because that's not kosher, but they would be in <laughs> Jerusalem and they were focused really, if they were only focused on the here and now, these Corinthians wouldn't have helped them. See, in, to the Jews in Jerusalem, becoming a Christian meant instant poverty, instant outcast. You would lose often your family right away. If they didn't come to faith also, they would ostracize you. They would throw you out. Your friends, they'd say, we don't want anything to do with that. Your business, if you had it, well, they would no longer frequent it. And all of a sudden, your finances would go down the tubes. And you see on top of that, the book of Acts tells us during the same period that he's writing here, there was a famine in that area specifically. And so they had not only the general problems, but they had a very specific problem at the time. And so Paul knew that if the Corinthian Christians were just here and now kind of people, they would have looked and said, well, here and now everything's going pretty well. I mean, there's the usual pressures, but we don't have it that bad. And yet... That selfishness was exactly what he was trying to get them outside of, the me, myself, and I little world. And so Paul reminds them there in this chapter, the world is not all that is. When you just look around and see it, you know, hey, remember back to 1 Corinthians 15, there's a glorious world to come. He says, but the world that is, well, it's not quite as perfect as heaven. There's a lot of problems here. And when we really believe that, when we really believe that not only what we see and touch that's right in front of us is real, but what is to come is real and even more real and more lasting and more permanent than what we have physically right in front of us, well, it changes our view, I hope, of possessions. The here and now idea, you know what it says? It says we have actually an opportunity right here, right now, that won't last forever. But if we invest in eternity, it can last forever. There's a way for here and now to affect then and there. And so Paul knew that the Gentile generosity had a very powerful effect. It would, that it would break down walls, that it would open doors for the Gospels, that they, that they would be able to say, hey, the Gentiles are giving money to us? I mean, they used to be hating us. Why would they care about us? Why would they do this? And it would be a very tangible and very visible way of them saying, hey, the love of Christ is real and it's bigger than the divisions that have been and some that have lasted even for centuries. And money talks, you guys know that. And one of the favorite words people like to hear money say is free. I don't know if you've ever heard that one, but free, that one tends to draw a crowd. And we had the NASCAR outreach uh, recently. A lot of you participated in that. And uh, some of you did directly, some of you indirectly, all of us as a church certainly praying for and participating in that. And if you've ever been to a NASCAR race or any sporting event, really, you know that there are a lot of people out there selling stuff, right? I mean, everything is jacked up a lot that day. You know, $5 water bottles, the little kind, you know, the little five bucks, you know, everything, and you're like, I'll pay it. I don't care. I'm dying out here. But 
people come to our little booth there, you know, our little spot, our little oasis out there in the desert. And you know what it says? Hey, the food is free. Free? How much is it? Free. You know, <laughs> did you say free? Yes, free. And all of a sudden you hear scurrying in all the RVs. You know, I think somebody just said free. And the <laughs> lemonade, free. And the coffee is free. And the water's free. And all of this stuff. And wow, burgers and chicken and hot dogs all free. Why would anyone do that? Well, again, it comes back to this. It comes back to love. It comes back to wanting to use the temporary possessions that we have and hold to say, you know, I want to invest this in something that will go far beyond this. And I want to communicate this in a way that is very tangible to people. And see, when we preach the gospel out there, it's amazing the response that we get through the weekend individually with people talking with them. They're all fascinated by free and you get to tell them you know what it's not the only thing that's free god's grace his gift of eternal life is freely given to all those who would believe and trust in him and wow it opens the door in a way that nothing else does you know i think about it, i believe we've really earned the right out there over the years to minister to those folks in such a way that people the first year they went eh, i don't know second year third year fourth year we keep coming back year after year and we have people comment on it and say you know what, at first I didn't know what you guys were about, but I'm coming to realize that you're out here because you love us and because you love the Lord. Yeah, that's right. And you know what, I was there out, uh, out at the, the track the first day on the Thursday, and this woman came up to me. I wanted to share this story because, again, we all participate in it. If you are a part of this church, if you prayed for that outreach, these are the kind of things going on. I had a woman come up to me and say to me, you know, sober in the morning, I'll tell you, she was sober as they get. She was... Uh, you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, you know, they, are these decisions real? Let me tell you, this lady was as sober as the dawn. And she said, you know what? Thank you to your church and to you for coming out here and doing this. I gave my life to Christ, she told me, at the service that you guys gave here, the Sunday service that you guys gave last year at the church service. And you know what? I took the materials you guys gave out, Bibles, you gave out study guides, all these things. I took those materials home. I read them in the RV. I did all those things. And you know what? When I got back to my home, in another state, I went and visited my mom at an uh, old folks home. That's where she lives. She's in a nursing home. And she said, you know what? I don't know a whole lot, but I was able to share that stuff with her from those materials. And she gave her life to the Lord too. And I have never seen her in years smile like this, this woman said. And she said, I want you to please tell the people it makes a difference. Thank you. And I said, you know what? No, thank you. Don't thank me. Thank you because you've just reminded me that little bitty things that we do here and now can make a difference there and then for so many. And sometimes we go, well, can I make a difference? Yes, absolutely. So he talks here about a specific reason, a specific missionary effort that they were involved in. Verse 2, some general principles that I think are real helpful. We'll go through them quickly as you see giving. He talks first about it being a priority. Again, this is a very here and now kind of chapter, and sometimes we say, oh, I like the big theoretical theology stuff. I don't like this stuff. Sometimes it gets too personal. It's too practical. You know, I might actually have to do it. No, it, it talks here about priority. On the first day of the week, he says, verse 2, and note that his visit was kind of a ways in the future, and yet he's still saying to him, you know, start here and now. Uh, don't put it off until this kind of way out there kind of thing and say, well, Paul probably won't be here another year. I don't have to think about it too hard now. He says, no, make it a priority now. Start the habit now. Lay something aside, he says. And he says, do it at the first. And I think this is real important because I don't know if your life has lived like ours, but if I... Wait till the last. Here's what I got, okay? Pocket fuzz, all right? This is all I got, pocket fuzz. Other pocket, I got a pen and pocket fuzz, okay? That's what I got by the end of the week. And so always he's saying in there, you know, if you want to give the Lord more than a broken rubber band and a, you know, a, a button off of one of your shirts, well, you got to lay it aside first. You have to be able to do that. And he talks about it being for each one, a very personal thing, not just a priority, but personal. It's always easy to think giving is somebody else's gift. You know, isn't that, uh, I have many spiritual gifts, but not the spiritual gift of giving. You know, that's for somebody else. That's for the rich people, whoever they might be. And he also talks about it being proportionate. You know, that you would store up as you prosper. And there's no specific figure given in this case, but it's very clear in the priority there. He's talking about, you know, the more you've been given, the more you're able 
to give. And so often people will come up with a certain percentage, and if they talk about that, they'll say, well, wait a minute, that's under law, isn't it? And I'll always say to that, well, you know, even if I give you that, which I could build a case for the fact that it's all New Testament as well, but even if I gave you that, that a specific uh, percentage was under law, well, in the New Testament, we're always over law, right? We're always doing more because love does more than law. Law requires something and love does it out of the goodness of their heart, now the desire of their heart. And I can think of a, a lot of illustrations, but maybe one that will be memorable for you, especially those who know me. I used to be a car addict, and uh, I was addicted to vintage Volkswagens. I don't know if anyone, you know, a lot of people have a lot of different addictions in the world, but that one's probably a strange one. You know, I could stand up in a, I don't know what it would be, a, a v, v, VW's meeting and say, you know, my name's Scott, and I'm a Volkswagen addict or something, you know, but... <laughs> I used to have six of them, if you can imagine that. I had, uh, my wife couldn't stop me. She tried to intervene, and I still had six of these things. I had buses, you know, the big campers. I had Beatles. Uh, don't picture run-down old nasty cars, though. Uh, these were show winners, you know, restored vehicles. My, I wouldn't say it was my pride and joy because it didn't actually bring me joy, as so often those things don't, but it was certainly my pride, and it was a 1954 ragtop Beetle. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, it had wide white walls. I mean, total attention getter. This thing was amazing. And I did win shows with it. But we never enjoyed it because, you know, the rain might fall on it or whatever. And my wife would say, could we drive it? No, we can't drive it. <laughs> it's low mileage. That's not why you get these things. You get them to enjoy them by looking at them, you know, and that's right. <laughs> And I couldn't enjoy it fully because there was one thing that wasn't right on it. And if you've ever known a, a vehicle addict, you know that it has to be right. It has to be the right year. It has to be the exact thing. And it just so happens that a 1954 Beetle has a specific taillight on it. It's called a heart taillight. It's, it's shaped like a heart. And so the law requires that a car have a taillight, right? But you can buy those for about 10 bucks. But love... Love bug, love, requires that you have a heart tail light, which is only available very uh, expensively. It's, it was about 500 bucks for the pair of these things. Then you say, whew, 500 bucks, did you pay it? Yes, I paid it. <laughs> and I paid it willingly and gladly. <laughs> Why? Again, I didn't know the Lord, but I certainly loved the bugs. And so, <laughs> love makes you willing to give far above the law. So just let's close it at that. Verse 2, you see priority, personal, proportionate. My wife stayed with me through it all. I love her more than the cars. I now have only a Volkswagen shirt, and that's all I have left, and a couple toys in my office. They're much cheaper. Okay, so the last one's pressure-free. You know, when you see it in verse 2, Paul says, let no collection be given while I'm there. I'm not real interested in that. You can imagine that if the Apostle Paul, if he could do it, walked into the room tonight, you know, and sat down next to you. And let's say we were doing something different and we we're passing the plate here tonight. And Paul's sitting right next to you when the plate comes by. You know what you would do. You'd say, Paul, um, could I borrow your pen? I have a very large check to write. You know, I'm going to be giving a whole lot to the, what is it, the Apostle Paul Missionary Fund. You know, get my picture with you. Hey, you don't mind, you know, me giving the big check like they do, you know, and all that sort of thing. Knowing full well it's going to bounce big time, but Paul will be on to his next mission trip anyway. Doesn't matter. But what he's saying here is, no, it's not like that. I don't want it to be that way. I want it to be private. I want it to be prayerful. I want it to be careful. I want it to be something that you would have no regrets because it wasn't manipulation that caused you to do it. It wasn't the emotion of the moment or the uh, you know, recognition of any of that kind of stuff. He says, you know what? God loves a cheerful giver. And I always say, if you can't give it cheerfully, just keep it because you'd be wasting it. And God is not broke, he's not in a cash crunch, and all those sort of things. It's not that we, he needs us to give, it's that we need us to give. Why? Because every time we give, we give away a part of our greed, a part of our selfishness, a part of that thing that's so easy to happen, which is for our possessions to possess us. And so it's not God's way of raising cash, it's his way of raising his kids. And it's the same way that we want our kids to be generous givers, right? And so God wants his to be the same. Now you see verse 3 and 4 real quickly, you look at those, it says, whenever I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I'll send it to bear your gift to Jerusalem. It's fitting, if it's fitting for me to go, I'll, they'll go with me. And so 
Again, I, I remind you, it's a here and now kind of chapter. It's got some very practical stuff. But I think it's so important for us to understand and embrace these things. And one of the words that you would see here is accountability. You know what Paul's saying? He's saying, you pick the people. I'm not going to have my little entourage come and do the collection and pa- put all the stuff into the backpacks and you never know where it went or any of that kind of stuff. He said, look, I'm making a collection. It's not for me. It's for the Jerusalem folks. And you pick the people. Who do you trust? Who do you know? You organize that. And Paul uh, taught us a lesson here that we should always not only do the right thing, but do it the right way. And I feel strongly about this. One of my roles here as as a pastor is administrative with the church, and we run a tight ship as much as we can, and we also have open books in that sense. And so there's so much here and now fraud. You know, people go, "I, I don't know if I can really get involved in things. There's so much manipulation, deception. Well, again, it comes down to individuals not only being heavenly minded, but that doesn't resolve or take away our earthly responsibilities. We ought to be above reproach. And Christians ought to be known in their businesses, in their affairs, uh, business affairs, not for their affairs. I'm not talking about that. (laughs) Unfortunately, that's the case in many cases. But, you know, Christians ought to be known for being above reproach to where people say the IRS says, man, don't bother uh, you know, going against a Christian, you're wasting your time. The accountability's there. The stuff that they're going to do, it's going to be above reproach. You're not going to find anything. And, you know, we have a saying around the office sometimes that will say, can't we just teach the Bible? You know, we'll get like an IRS thing and we've got to fill it all out and it's a big packet and all this stuff. And can't we just teach the Bible? You know, do we really have to do all these forms and procedures and stuff? But the thing is, That is teaching the Bible. It's living it out, living out the kind of responsibility and above reproach life that God has called us to here and now. Because again, everybody thinks, oh, well, here and now, you know, you got to do it a little different. You know, this is the world. This is reality. We can't live it the way it talks about there. In heaven, okay. In heaven, I'll do it right. But, you know, here I kind of got to do it the world's way. No, you got to do it the word's way. And he says in there, what you're believing affects how you'll be living in every area and in the area of possessions. What you believe about the there and then will dramatically affect how you behave here and now. Not just how you handle your money, but how you invest your time. That's where he goes on in the next part to talk about his plans. You know, he's planning for his time, how he's going to invest not only financial resources, but you see him also saying, you know, I'm going to plan out my time. I'm going to plan out how God's going to use my talents in these different things. And so you see him Uh, saying, when I come to you, I pass through Macedonia, verse 5, for I am passing through Macedonia, and it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you, that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not wish to see you now on the way. He's saying, I don't want to just have a little layover. He says, I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits. Now, throughout the scripture, especially if you look in the book of Acts and some of the more Uh, narrative portions of the Bible, you're going to see that Paul was a man with a plan. He was a guy who always had some desires, some expectations, some things that he was praying through and planning to do. And so he was a man with a mission. He wasn't a guy who was just kind of drifting through life saying, well, you know, I'll just let the Spirit lead, whatever, you know. And so often that is just a euphemism for I have no idea what I want to do or what I'm supposed to do, so I'm just letting the Spirit lead. You go, well, I don't know about that. So Paul, he knew time was not something to waste, not something to just fritter away. And so chapter 15, he talked about eternity. And eternity is a wonderful thing to enjoy in heaven, but it's not what we have here. In chapter 16, he's reminding us again, here and now, we don't have all the time in the world to waste. And some Christians seem to have, again, that impression that to plan is not spiritual. You know, that if you really have faith, you just kind of throw it all out there and say, well, I just trust it in God, you know, that sort of thing. And just go with the flow. But again, that can be a very unspiritual thing. See, Paul was a man who had plans. And I would ask just very directly, how about you? What, what is it that you're planning for the next year by God's grace? What is it that you're looking and saying, hey, this is an area of growth I want to see. I want to see myself more involved with this. I want to see myself more able to do that. I want to see the Lord stir up this area of my life and give more fruit in that part of my life. And so if you fail to plan, 
you plan to fail. Maybe you've heard that said. Or if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. You know, these are kind of fatherly sayings, of course, and I can't wait to use them on my teenagers, you know. But, but as you see these things, you know, you, can, you can't read the Bible without coming to two realizations, which is that God desires us to be planning prayerfully, carefully our steps, and he also reserves the right to change the plan. That's the balance that is so biblical. It's not that you say, well, God will figure it out, so I'm not going to plan. No, he wants us to plan, and then he says, I want you to stay flexible to my further leading. And if you read through 2 Corinthians sometime, you'll see that Paul went through about plan B, C, D, E, as somewhere down in the, you know, probably toward X, Y, Z, before he finally actually accomplished all the things that he had promised and planned and desired to do. But he did all the things that he said he would do, just in a kind of different order in a much different way than he had thought. And so I, I like to put it this way again, that living here and now, we have to have that tension kind of, that balance between, well, I've got my eyes on the eternal, but you know what? There's some things to take care of right here. And Chuck Smith says it so well. He said, blessed are the flexible, they will not be broken. And yet I've seen that man be a man with a plan that has been blessed by God, and none of that happened by accident, like, whoops, you know. Again, sometimes people mistake that, oh, we let the Holy Spirit lead. Yes, with incredible diligence, incredible care, and great flexibility when God took another turn. And so, Paul, he had qualifiers on all of his promises and all of his plans. He said, well, I, it may be this, if the Lord permits. And that's a good tag to put under any of our prayers and plans. And so, you probably know what your weakness is. And if you don't, just ask your spouse or ask one of your friends. They'll be happy to tell you. But if you're a very rigid planner, you know what's funny? God's going to try to counterbalance that. How? If you're so rigid, you're never flexible, he's going to bend you, and he's going to bend you. And if he has to, he'll break you. Because he says, you know what? You've got to learn to go the way I like you to go. But you know what? If you're one of those people who never has a plan and just kind of stumbles around all the time and all that sloppy procrastination and call it spiritual, God will counterbalance that. And he'll say, you know what? You've got to learn to plan. And I will have you pay some prices for not doing that. And so I like the way the psalmist put it. Psalm 90, 12. He said, teach us to number our days. That'll give us a heart and a mind of wisdom. You know, when you realize, hey, the here and now, it's slipping away quickly. And there's going to be an eternity and the consequences of our decisions now do last. And so Paul says, I will tarry in Ephesus till Pentecost, verse 8. And for verse 9, he says, a great and effective door is open to me. And there are many adversaries. Now, the thing that I like to look here at is the fact that he says, you know what, there are great doors, extreme open areas. He says, but there's many adversaries. And any time there are opportunities, there are going to be opponents. There are going to be opposition in your life, obstacles in your life. And Paul actually was writing this letter to the Corinthians from Ephesus. And Ephesus, in that place, well, they were trying to kill Paul. Why? Because he was so effective in his ministry that the sale of idols went down. You know, they were having sales at the dollar store, and they couldn't push their pagan things. And they're like, you know... Who's causing this glut in the market? Paul. That guy's preaching so effectively and people are turning to God and they don't want this junk anymore. And they said, we've got to get rid of him. Instead of changing their own life, they said, we've got to kill Paul. And Paul says, man, I've got to stay. This is such an effective door, I can't miss it. And some of us would say, whoa, I guess God's closing the door. They're out to get me. Instead, he said, you know what? I've got the here and now and I'm going to use it as long as God allows and open doors are not forever. That's a real important thing to see in your life. When there's a window that God has opened, even if there's going to be obstacles, and there always will be, because if there's an opportunity, there's going to be opposition. Well, here and now, limited time. Well, sometimes people have said time is money. I think it's way more valuable than that. You know what? I found money in old pairs of pants. You know, I'd go back through the closet and go, oh, $20. All right. I have never found 20 minutes in my pants pocket, you know, whoa, hey, 20 minutes, set back the clock. No, once it's gone, it is gone. 
And so, yeah, I don't like to waste money, but I hate to waste time because even the older I get, I start looking for the break. You know, when you're a kid, you start looking for the gas. How do you speed this thing up, man? I want to be older. Now you start going, where's the emergency brake? Where's the, how do you slow this thing down, man? Opportunities. Hey, when they're there, we're going to drive a semi through them. I love the way Pastor Pedro says that about our outreaches. He said, I don't know what next year will look like, but this year the door's open and we're going to drive a semi truck through it. And that's what Paul was kind of saying. While it's there, I'm going to take advantage of it. And maybe there's some things in your life that you've been procrastinating on and you said, man, there's just too many obstacles. Too much opposition. Maybe later, Lord. Later, Lord. Hold that door, you know. When I can get there and there's nothing in the way, I'll go through that door. But 1 Corinthians 16.9 is such an important one for us to look at. Look at it there. It says that the spiritual opportunities will always be accompanied with spiritual opposition. Because when the Lord is moving, well, guess what? He's not the only player in the game. And when he is moving, the devil is moving too. And Paul never equated, like so many Christians do, an easy road for the right road. To say just, well, you know, if God's really in it, it the doors will open wide. Well, they will. And there will be somebody blocking that door too. And you're going to have to push through that with perseverance. And so the adversaries for Paul were not a reason to leave or to give up. They were a reason to stay, the very reason he said to stay. And just like that film broke, you know, in my life, and it brought in that harsh reality and all that sort of thing, I know that there's times in your life where that's exactly how you feel, that you say, hey, a shock came in. I didn't expect this. I didn't know this was going to happen. I was having such a great time, and then boom, all of a sudden, and I know for sure in a room this size that there's at least one person who considered throwing in the towel, maybe on life or their spiritual life this week, you know, just saying, well, that's it. I give up, Lord. I can't take it anymore. I've had it. Here's my Bible. Here's my badge. I don't want to do this anymore. I know there's at least one person who thought about that this week. How do I know that for sure? Because it was me. And that's why. <laughs> now you're saying, Pastor, how could you say such a thing? Because... I like to tell the truth. And you know what? Pastors are people too. And we get discouraged and we have things come against us. And that's the very reason that not only do we sometimes do that, but we need to see verses like 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And it's important to know it. And it's important for me to say it. When he said, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Because you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so, yeah, Paul got discouraged along the way. Paul had times where he said, man, I despaired even of life. I got to the end of my rope. But he said, you know what? That's where God really, really showed up. And I'm trying to learn. And I hope that we can all learn it together, that sometimes that opposition, man, it can backfire on the devil. Why? Because he'll come in and do that. And you go, man, all you're doing is convincing me that this is a wide open door of opportunity and I am not giving up. Because as Paul said, you know, the here and now is what I've got. And the there and then, well, I can sit back and rest at that point. And so any opposition is just a great opportunity for us to persevere and make an eternal difference in our world. And that's why what we are believing will make such a difference in how we will be living. How we will be living in the here and now. In our possessions, yeah, that's our treasures, of course. Then our time, our planning, our talents, you know, you see those things, it's going to make a difference in how you spend time. Some people would say, well, if I know I'm going to live forever, I might as well just waste this time. No, because there's a direct connect between the here and now and the there and then, and there are rewards and there are experiences of eternity that God says they're, they're related. And the final one, the final P word I want to share with you tonight is people. People is the most important word of the three, really. Possessions, yeah. Planning, yeah, okay. People, this is where it ends. If we keep our mind on the resurrection reality, the things that were found in 1 Corinthians 15, when we get to chapters like 1 Corinthians 16, you know what we're going to see? We're going to see possessions, okay. You know what? My possessions and my plants, I'm going to focus them in on things that will make a difference in the lives of people. Because money isn't eternal, you know. Debt can feel like it, but money is not eternal. Time is not eternal. Even your talents, whatever they may have, are not eternal. There's things I used to be able to do really well on a skateboard. I can't do them anymore. The talents are not eternal. But people are eternal. People are eternal. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 was all about. Everybody will live somewhere forever and ever. Somewhere. And so God gives us opportunities in the here and now 
to affect the there and then for people's lives. Not only our own life, but the lives of those around us. And that's why Paul was such a people person. He was so passionate about the things of the Lord because he cared about God's people. He directed his time and his talents, of which he had many, and the treasures that he had toward reaching people. And he gave things up willingly and said, man, I'm going to focus on one thing, the one thing that lasts, because this stuff doesn't last. My time will be gone soon, but people will last forever. And so many would say, eh, you know, you're a pastor. You're supposed to be a people person. That's why it happened for you. Well, I wasn't always, and I'm not always. But you see, in Paul's life, he had to have this change of heart. He had to have something happen to him. He started to think about eternity, and he started to think about his own life differently. See, the Bible says that Paul wasn't always a people person. He was a persecuting person. He was a guy who actually jailed people for their faith in Christ. He says by his own admission, I was an insolent man. That's a guy who's got a short fuse and not much fun to be around. It. And he says, I was a blasphemer. I was self-righteous and legalistic. I mean, you know, it sounds like somebody you'd want to hang out at the party with, right? But he started to think about eternity in his own life and he began to come to the realization, man, the only thing that's going to matter in eternity is the only thing I can take with me is my own life and the lives of those I've affected. That's the only thing that's going to last. And so if you want to have the heart of heaven, if you want to have the heart of God, if you want to be a people person and say, well, I, I haven't focused on that much. I haven't connected much with people in life. You know what? It's connecting with the person of Christ that's going to connect you with other people. It's that heart that he has because that's all he cared about. That's all he cared about when he was here. And it's all he cares about now. And so Jesus changed the heart of Paul and he can change the heart of any person. And you see that Paul was a phenomenal person, of course. We look at his life and go, wow, what a guy. But he was surrounded by incredible people as well. And looking at this, we're going to go through it quickly. You can take some time as you like to go look at some of these lives that were around Paul. But you see that uh, the greatest thing that's happened in my life, as I really think about it, is first of all, getting to know Jesus. But getting to know the people that Jesus has brought into my life has given me the greatest and deepest and most enduring friendships I could ever have had, starting with my wife and going beyond that. But when you think about it, hey, all of that would have been lost to me. That, I wasn't headed toward a direction of having those things in my life. Maybe some other things, but not the things that would last. And so you see in verse 10, if Timothy comes, that was one of Paul's big friends there, but he was a little guy. He was a younger guy. He was a guy who was kind of timid, as we see in the scriptures. And so Paul puts in a good word for him, and he says, see that he'll be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord just as I do. Therefore, let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace, that he may come to me, for I'm waiting for him with the brethren. Now, Paul had written some pretty controversial stuff in this, in this book, if you remember it. And so here's Timothy kind of bringing along the letter, and he's like, hey, don't kill the messenger. You know, <laughs> here's the message. Don't beat up Timothy because you wanted to beat up Paul. He says, wait for me. If you want to throw some punches, you can throw them at me, but send Timothy on his way in peace. Don't beat up Timothy. Now, verse 12, he talks about a guy named Apollos. This is really Interesting, because Paul urges Apollos to go strongly, it says there. But Apollos said, no, not now. I'll come at a convenient time. Now, we think, you know, Apollos is sitting there by the pool, and he says, oh, it's, sorry, man, it's not convenient right now. No, that's, that's not the meaning of the word here. It means at a time when he could actually get there and get there without uh, it being a major loss to what he's already doing. And so the Corinthian church there was divided. Remember those early chapters where it said, I'm of Apollos. Well, I like Paul, you know, and I'm following Christ and I'm of none of the above, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And I love it because what you see here is that though they may have fought about these guys, these guys were not fighting. You know, Paul, he didn't see Apollos as a threat. He didn't see him as a, a person who was divisive or any of that sort of thing. No, he sees him as a partner. He sees him as a solution to the problem. He says, hey, Apollos, get there. I know you'll say the same things in a different way. Maybe you'll reach some people I haven't. And so you see that going on there in Paul's heart. And Apollos says, well, not now, but maybe later. And I like this because what you see is that Paul was a guy who was persuasive. He was a guy who was transparent. If he had a friendship with a guy, he'd say, look, man, please go down there now. You know, he, he didn't just kind of beat around the bush. 
It says he strongly urged him. But this shows the difference between being, being a people person and a people pleaser. See, Paul was not a people pleaser. He was a people person. He cared about people, but he did not please people. He didn't live to please people, and neither did Apollos. You know? And we can't meet the expectation of every person on the planet. There's no way you can be a people pleaser. You know? Don't mistake that and go that route, because it's a sure way to fail. And from this situation, we, hear, we see here that Apollos was able to say no to Paul. Even a guy like Paul, he said, no, nope, I'm not going to do that, Paul, not right now. And some people think yes is the only spiritual answer. Can you do this? Yes. Will you be there Friday? Yes. I need it. Yes. Yes. We need it. Yes. 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 Well, you know, some people think no is the only good answer, but being led of the Spirit, you know, being able to say, it's, that's not what God's calling me to do right now. And so you, sometimes I think people get burned out in ministry and don't make it for the long haul because they say yes to everything and they're really not following the Lord on when to say yes and what to say yes to and what to say no to. And one of the things I've had to learn along the way, and I've been doing this, I guess now 13 years or so, is you know that glorified body that Paul talked about in chapter 15? I don't have it, you know? That one that never feels pain, fatigue, or, or any of the rest of that, I do not have that yet. And maybe some of you have something a little closer than I do, but it just, in the here and now, and I can't say yes to everything. And to say yes to one thing is to say no to something else. And so I'm having to learn, and along the way, that you know what, it's impossible to please people, but it is possible to please God. And so what you do is you say yes to God's plan, and sometimes there's going to be people with a wonderful plan for your life and you're going to have to say no to them, but say yes to God. And so verse 13, Paul throws in some things here. He just can't leave out you know, some of these sentences in here. He says, watch, stand fast, fast in the faith. Be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. And so that's such a beautiful balance there. It's the kind of life that he lived. You know, He wasn't a marshmallow man, but he also wasn't a real tough tough guy who never cared or never cried, any of that sort of stuff. He says, you know what? Grow up, watch out, stand firm, be brave, be strong, and wrap that all in love. A tender and tough guy. And so you see in verse 15, the kind of friends he had, the kind of friend he was. And you see him talking there about a household, Stephanus. And it, the key word that I want you to pay attention to in verse 15 is devoted. It says that they devoted themselves to ministry. Does anyone have the King James version of that? If you do, the straight King James, not new King James, just different word used. It says they addicted themselves to the ministry. I, I love that thought. You know, again, there's lots of addictions. I had a VW one, as I mentioned. But you know what? I just traded for a better addiction, I think. One that has uh, blessed my family, one that has been a great thing, which is just addicted to the ministry. And again, not talking about the kind of thing where you never say no, but I'm just talking about just loving to be around God's people and what's going on in God's work. And so that's the kind of people that, that this family was. And Paul says, man, look for folks like that and be like them and help them in whatever way you can. And I love thinking about that because so often people will say, well, the church has gotten big, it's hard to get to know people, all that stuff. You know what? This is the answer I can give, and it's not a, hopefully a self-serving answer. It's a God-serving answer. Serve. Serving is the way to keep a church small. Every friend that I have today that I would consider my closest friends, it's all people that I have served alongside in various capacities. You know, everything from... Uh, cafe style stuff to tape ministries to you know cleaning up things to setting up and tearing down just anything you know everything and those things those are where the friendships form in those actual frontline things and that'll keep the world very small for you and yet open big doors and so he talks about these guys he talks about some different ones in here Aquila and Priscilla in verse 19 and then coming down to verse 20 he says Greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, please, you know, none of, the, none of the guys make this your memory verse. You know, you're all thinking, I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm going to choose where I sit real careful next time. And when Pedro says, go ahead and high five someone, I'm going to give him more than a high five. No. This was just a cultural thing. You know, we do a slight variation of it here in Miami. I'm still trying to learn it as a gringo. I've had some mishaps along the way. <laughs> Yeah, we won't go into that. But Paul was a people person, and, he, and his affection comes so 
clear in all these things. But this is so important. It wasn't just all kiss, kiss, hug, hug, you know, that sort of thing with Paul all the time. Well, Paul gave the Corinthian church a pretty good spanking here and there along the way in this thing. And I like that because, you know what? A friend isn't someone who just tells you what you want to hear. A friend is someone who will tell you what you need to hear. Now, not all the time. You know, nobody wants this person who just, I live to spank you. I live to, you know, <laughs> to tell you where you're wrong. No, not that. But I am so thankful for a handful of people in my life who would tell me, Scott, you are wrong. You're messing up. And I would take it seriously. Why? Because they love me enough to say it. Proverbs 27, 5 through 6, an important verse. It says, an open rebuke is sometimes better than love carefully concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Remember, Judas kissed Jesus as he betrayed him. And so often, again, some of the things that people have said to me, they go, ow, but you're right. And I really needed to hear that. Man, I really needed to hear that. And so verse 21, 22, you see Paul pins just a few things personally. I think it's, it's great. He has been dictating. That was the, the custom of the culture. But at the end, he takes up the pen and he signs his own name. And he also says a few thoughts just right in his own words. He says, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O Lord, come. That's verse 22 there. You know, Paul doesn't mince words. He uses two words there, just so you know what they are. They're anathema and maranatha. Maybe you've heard some of those words, anathema. Anathema, what does it mean? It means eternally damned, under the curse, doomed to destruction. You know, it's not a a word in in common use today, but, uh, you know, maybe you can throw it around out there on the playground or whatever. Anathema, you know. And nobody will say it was a foul word, but, but Paul... Here he, he talks about this, and you know what he's saying? He's saying, look, if you don't love the Lord here and now, don't expect hope in the there and then. He just comes out and says it that way. Now, again, Paul, do you think he was smiling as he says, ah, ha, ha, anathema, you know? <laughs> I don't believe so. You know, he would have crawled on broken glass to reach one person so they wouldn't be under that curse. But sin is a curse, and the only solution is Jesus. And I suspect he smiled as he wrote the next word, though, Maranatha. You know what that word means? Sometimes you've heard it associated with music, Maranatha music, but, oh, Lord, come. That's what it means. Lord, come and make it quick. And Paul, of all people, certainly knew that there were a lot of pains and problems in the here and now. In the here and now, man, there's plenty to look at and go, anathema. But that should also cause us to do the same thing he did, which he said, just said, Maranatha. Maranatha, Lord, come quickly, come soon. And so verse 23, the grace of our Lord Christ, Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Jesus Christ. In Christ Jesus, amen. So that concludes 1 Corinthians there as a book. And it was a corrective letter. It was a directive letter. It was very confrontational. But it's so important to see where it ends there. And it was wrapped all through it, which is, this is a love letter. It's a love letter. And again, you, sometimes you think, oh, love is, is never having to say you're sorry or never having to, uh, you know, correct anybody or, oh, I love them too much to tell them that truth. No, Paul didn't enjoy correcting the Corinthians. He didn't. Elsewhere, and later in 2 Corinthians, he even says, man, I was bummed the minute I wrote the letter in a way I was just waiting to see what would happen you know would you guys be upset would you like what I wrote would you react to what I wrote and it wasn't like text messaging today you know where you can get a pretty quick response he had to wait a long time to even find out whether the people accepted or rejected his message but he risked his reputation why because he loved them he risked his life why because he loved them he took the possibility that they would look at him and misunderstand his message as he challenged them to change because he loved them. That was the whole thing. And Paul, he knew this whole thing. Here and now, it's a matter of life and death. And here at the church, we have a voicemail system. Maybe some of you have called it after hours or whatever, and you get the little, you know, press this extension, all the rest. And at the end, it says, if this is a life and death emergency in after hours, please, you know, call 911 if it's a medical emergency, but otherwise, call the following number and you will be uh, receiving a call back from a pastor. And this is my month uh, to 
carry that emergency phone. And I got a call last night. Uh, I was working on this teaching, as a matter of fact, phone was sitting right next to me, and I looked at the caller ID, and I didn't recognize the number. Some people just call it, um, you know, some people that I know call it because they know I'm holding it, but um, I didn't recognize the number, and I didn't recognize the voice when I, when I answered, and it sounded very, very distraught, you know, it was like, uh, it sounded like they've been crying, maybe even drinking or whatever else, and so they said, my name's John, and and my dog just died, they said. And, I, you know, I went, mm, okay. Uh, but they said, I need, I need some help. And the, the person sounded very sincere and all the rest. And so uh, I told him, well, our family has a dog, and we've had dogs, and I know what it is to have a pet die, you know, trying to comfort them and all the rest. And he asked me, you know, if dogs go to heaven. As, and I said... <laughs> Said, well, if you believe the movies, they do, and, and, and you know, certainly the good ones do, and, you know, the Christian's dogs do. No, I gave him my best Bible man answer, you know, it, it was, well, the Bible's not clear on that, but it does say that there's no sorrow or tears, and that anything that would cause grief certainly would not be uh, there, and all the rest of that. So he, he then said, listen, I know this isn't a life or death emergency, but... Um, I, I would need to know your advice on it. Would, is it a waste of money for me to pay for a plot at a pet cemetery? <laughs> now, right then, I was getting ready to... I started to answer, and the guy started to laugh. You know who it was? Pastor Pedro. <laughs> Pastor Pedro. He crank called me on the emergency phone. <laughs> now, his voice was messed up. You guys know he's been sick this week. And, and Pastor George, you know, mixed some kind of cocktail from me. I, so I'm, I'm, I'm writing it off as he was still, you know, on some kind of NyQuil hangover or something. And, <laughs> but I am plotting my revenge. So if any of you have any suggestions... But, you know, as I think about that, that phone has rung uh, with some things that have made me laugh like that. But, you know, th that phone rings more often than we wish it did for serious reasons. You know, pa Pastor Scott, um, someone, someone has died. They are no longer in the here and now. They are on to the there and then. And so as I think about those things, you know, the here and now, uh, yeah, there's stuff to laugh about. There's stuff to enjoy. But there's one thing that is not a laughing matter, and that's the, the question that hangs over some people's lives when it comes to that. You know, and, and the conclusion of God's message, I just want to make sure that everyone here walks away understanding it, that the here and now affects directly the there and then. And what you're believing will affect how you will be living. And no matter what you're believing, I can tell you this, you will be leaving. You will be leaving. You know, and the big question is, where do you go from there. Where do you go from there? And if there's anyone here in this room who doesn't know for a fact that they could answer that question, well, I go into the presence of the Lord. Well, how do you know that? Well, the Bible teaches that, that that is the answer that is given to the children of God, to those who have put their faith in him. And so we're going to close out this service as we do every week with an opportunity for you to settle the issue of eternity. If there's anyone here in this room who wants to make a commitment to Christ here tonight, this is your opportunity to do it. How do you do it? Well, at the end of the prayer, I'm going to give you an opportunity just to raise your hand. And by raising your hand, you're saying, yes, I want Christ in my life. See, coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. Coming to Christ makes you a Christian. And so that is what it really is to do that. If you've never done it and you couldn't answer that with absolute certainty, well, you can walk away here tonight with that certainty of eternity. And so let's bow our heads, let's close our eyes, and let's pray together. If you're a believer here tonight, if you're... A Christian, pray for anyone who hangs in the balance. Anybody who maybe is here in this room with an uncertainty, with a guilt, with a fear of their future, without knowing uh, what it is that would happen to them after they die. And Father, I thank you for the practical points that you have put in this passage for us tonight, for us to consider, Lord, that really there is such a a sense that comes from your word that you answer not only the big questions in our life but the small questions the day-to-day -day things and the things that stretch out beyond our wildest imagination and God as we are here tonight considering this time 
I just pray for anybody who's here in this room who doesn't know with certainty that they have eternal life, the gift that you have said, hey, it's free for the taking, but you do have to take it. You do have to come by faith. You do have to accept. You do have to receive. And so, God, if there's anybody here in this room who's never done that or wants to do it here for the first time, I pray that they would have the courage, the boldness, and the desire to do that through the work of your Spirit as we pray.